sports clip. Yeah, perfect. Well, guys, I am so excited to have these two guests here today. We literally are so um, blessed to have both Gretchen and Scott with us because they are super busy and powerhouses in their industries. And I am just so grateful that you guys have taken the morning to be with us. And I can't wait to learn all of the things that you guys have to teach us today. Uh, first, we're going to start out with Scott Groves, and then we're going to go to Gretchen Coley. And then at the end, we're going to leave some time for Q&A for everybody. So be sure that you guys stay on with us. Uh, this is going to be packed full of tangible takeaways and so many good tidbits. So tune in and uh, make sure you stay with us. And so without further ado, Scott, we'll start with you. Um, I was so like impressed by reading all of the things that you're, uh, that you're doing right now. I mean, you've got, I read that um, you have done almost a billion dollars in funding loans with Movement Mortgage. You do about a hundred million uh, loans per year or per month. Um, you're a podcaster with a hit podcast. You've got a best-selling book on Amazon. Um, you run a coaching business, specializing in like marketing, lead generation, sales. I cannot wait to hear what you've got for us today. Super, super excited to get started. Um, and then we also have the queen of new construction, uh, Gretchen Coley from North Carolina. Guys, I will tell you, I was watching a good friend of mine, um, Allison, she and her husband, Will, built a house. And I remember seeing Gretchen for the first time, and I had stars in my eyes because I'm like, she's not on HGTV? Like, what? She is such a powerhouse when it comes to marketing, innovation, like, her team is fantastic. They all do such a wonderful job presenting their houses, working with builders, and they really do own the market uh, in the triangle and even beyond as it relates to like new construction. Um, and I am just so impressed. Um, you guys have done over, like sold over a thousand homes yeah. and your marketing and uh, technology just seems to be getting, I don't even know how, but even better and better as the months go by. So I am so excited to take a deep that and learn from you about how this new construction, um, you know, thing is, is changing so rapidly. So I can't wait to dive into that here shortly. So I'm yes. excited to be here. Yay. So good. And we will come right back to you in about 20 minutes. And then uh, Scott, let's get going. Um, I'm going to let you kind of just take it from here. We're talking about winning in multiple offer situations. So Scott is from East Los Angeles, and they have been experiencing this for like 10 years now. Um, so he's got some really good tidbits to share with us. So I'm going to cut my camera and Scott, it's all you. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you to anybody who's in the audience watching live right now or watching the replay on Facebook. I know there's a million things you could be doing right now. So thanks for being here and being present. Turn off the phone, turn off the email. I can't wait to hear everything that Gretchen has to say about new construction. And then, you know, if you're going to be somewhere, be present, right? So as um, as was mentioned, I don't do quite $100 million a month in loans. If I did, I might be retired by now. But our team does about $100 million a year in loans. That's a little misleading because I am here in Southern California where our average loan amount is about 600,000. So not as many uh, units as some of the real hard chargers out there in the Carolinas and North Carolina where you all are at. Uh, but yeah, our team is pretty successful. Uh, I also wrote a book on lead generation that was an Amazon bestseller. I also run a coaching program where we coach about 120 loan officers because at the end of the day, what you all are experiencing out here in Los Angeles, we've been going through for 10 years. Uh, just dumb luck. The neighborhoods I work in, which are called like Eagle Rock, Highland Park, Echo Park, for years in a row, Redfin, the Wall Street Journal, they had those as the most competitive markets and also as like the hippest neighborhoods where property values were going up double digits every six months. So it's been crazy. Um, you know, uh, one of the properties that I did a loan on was featured cover story of the Wall Street Journal because they had 72 offers 
and ended up going a quarter of a million dollars over the list price. And so this has just been our reality for a long time. So when I was asked to come in and talk, I'm like, yeah, this is right in our wheelhouse. Uh, so thank you so much for being on. And the first thing that I would just say, this is kind of just general sales principles 101, right? It doesn't matter whether you're a loan officer, you're a realtor, you're a title rep, you're talking to your kids, you're trying to convince your spouse of something. The bottom line is that frustration and disappointment happens when our expectations don't meet reality, right? Our expectations don't meet reality. Like, I don't know, maybe the first time my wife saw me with my shirt off at the pool, like expectations were probably up here. Reality maybe ended up being down here, right? And that creates frustration. And so what I would say in this market where your buyers are having to make multiple offers before they get an offer accepted, they're having to go over the list price. They have to do all of this crazy stuff just to try to get into a house where I know the market in your area was normally or in a normalized market where there's a normal amount of inventory, you know, you can get them pre-approved on Monday or Tuesday. They can be out looking for a week or two, go into contract Saturday, open the deal on Monday, right? That was kind of the normalized market. And now there's all this frustration building because the client's expectation is, well, I want to buy a house. I'm pre-approved. Let's get into a house. And you know, as the professionals that you are in the real estate industry, no, no, no. The reality is way up here. The bar to get an offer accepted is way up here. And, and your expectation is maybe down here or maybe they're reversed. Anytime there's a lack of, or there's a gap between reality and expectation, you're going to have frustration. You're going to have angry clients. You're going to have clients that get cold feet. You're going to have clients that even though you know they could get the offer accepted if they step up $10,000 in price, um, you know, maybe they're not ready to step up $10,000 in price. So I would just really encourage a bulk of, in my opinion, the bulk of the work that realtors do is in negotiating the contract and, and kind of shepherding the deal through the contract phase. Here in California, we call that escrow. So sorry if I use the wrong vernacular. Um, what I would say is that for most realtors these days, a majority of the work is now coming in the expectation building phase, right? The buyer consult, explaining what's going on with the market, explaining what happens if the appraisal comes in below the contract price, explaining how many offers there are, explaining why being pre-approved, fully approved, fully underwritten, shortening the contingencies or the due diligence, why all this stuff is normal for the market, right? And I would say more than ever, as the professional that you are, you've got to take those extra five or six phone calls, that extra half hour, that hour at coffee, explaining to your buyers and your sellers, you know, what is the reality versus your expectation? And what can be challenging for us, having worked in the industry for a year, five years, 21 years, as I have, now I feel really old being in this business 21 years, um, however long you've been in this business, all of this stuff comes second nature to us, right? I'm constantly reminding myself and reminding my team that, hey, our reality is here because we deal with this 20, 25 times a month. Our client's expectation is probably way over here out in outer space, right? If you ever play that game Battleship, uh, where you call out the numbers B12, A6, C4, you're just kind of guessing where the ships are, right? And that's really what our clients are doing because we know exactly where the ships are. We place the ships on our board. They're kind of just guessing and they're pinging and they're, they're looking at stuff online and they're watching HGTV and they're getting all kinds of negative expectations. And it's our job as professionals to really talk through what the reality is. Um, and a lot of times, you know, it sounds a little demeaning. We have to dumb it down, right? Because we don't even know where our clients' expectations are. We don't know what we saw, what they saw on TV or what they read on Redfin or pick any other online source that's giving them all the knowledge when they really don't know what's going on. So we got to dumb it down a little bit. We got to step back. We got to talk about what the reality is. And we have to build that information up front about what's really going on on the market so that there's not this gap between reality and expectation. So that's the number one tip that I would get everybody as far as getting the offer accepted because we're letting the troops know what's really going on in the battlefield, right? We've got to inform. You're the general, you've got to inform your clients, the troops, like what's really going on. You have to give them the lay of the land. The next thing I would say is that language really matters. The language we use, the way we decide to describe things, this really matters in one, getting an offer accepted, 
But almost more importantly than that, setting the right expectations and then holding the deal together once you go under contract. For example, I never say ever, 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 I'm going to say it right now and then I'm going to be mad at myself just for saying it. I never say the appraisal came in low or the appraisal came in below value. No, nope, that's not the case. The appraisal came in right where it's supposed to come in at the value of which the appraiser could assign value to the house based on the other comps. What I'm constantly reminding realtors and clients is like, hey, the appraisal might come in below the contract price, might come in at the contract price, might come in above the contract price. And when you use the right language, what happens is there's a much easier conversation to hold the deal together or explain to our clients why they might need to come in with a little bit more cash to close or they might need to restructure the deal because you've used the right language and you've said, hey, look, market value, aka what the market is bearing, what people are willing to pay for a property, that might be different, that might be higher than what an appraiser can scientifically bring the appraisal in at. Right. And you can explain this in your expectation versus reality kind of outline. You can say, look, what the appraiser is doing is they're looking backwards six months and they're trying to find similar property within half a mile or a mile or two miles, depending on whether you're more suburban or rural. Um, and they can only go back a certain amount. They can only adjust for a certain square footage. So a lot of times the appraiser can only prove that a property is worth two hundred and eighty thousand. However, what the market might be speaking to is a price of 310,000 because there's five or six people willing to pay 310. So this is what we're going to do, Mr. And Mrs. Customer. The client or the appraiser might not be able to justify your sales price or the price that you're willing to pay, but that's okay. You know, we'll find a way to come up with the extra cash, we'll restructure the deal, we'll talk to your lender, but if the appraisal comes in below the contract price, that doesn't mean the house that you're buying isn't worth what you're paying for it. It just means that the market is speaking to a slightly higher price than what the appraiser can prove, right? These are important things in the language and the messaging of how we talk about the deal uh, that will help you keep the deal together. Now, to keep the offer accepted, or sorry, to help get the offer accepted, a lot of times, you all know, and I know, it just kills me that the client will dig their heels in, right? They're like, well, I'll pay 290 for this property, but there's no chance I'd pay 300. And I'm like, okay, why? <laughs> like, like you, you really know that that house per square footage with the views, with the neighborhood, you really know it's worth 290, but there's no way it's worth 300. Guess what? Five years ago, it was worth 210. Um, but what, I, what I'm constantly doing, again, language matters, right? Do you care about the price, Mr. and Mrs. Client? Or do you really care about the payment, right? At the end of the day, I'll ask clients this all the time. I'll be like, hey, what'd you pay for your last car? And I'll be I have like 32,000 ish. I'm like, great, what's your interest rate? Uh, I, I, I don't know, I think it's like three. And I'm like, great, what's your payment? Oh, my payment's $412.67. Because the client knows what the payment is. They care about what the payment is, right? That's all that matters once they buy the car. And then I tell them to go look up their invoice and sure enough, they were off by like $5,000 on what they paid for the car. They have no freaking clue what the interest rate is. So picking your language and being like, look, you know, for each $10,000 that we go up in purchase price, it adds about 50 bucks a month. Okay, so for each $10,000 that we go up in purchase price or $10,000 that you put down, if you want to look on the downside, raises or lowers your payment about 50 bucks a month. So, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Client, like this is the house that you're going to live in for a long time. You have to be comfortable about it. I never want to put somebody in a house that doesn't really work for them or keeps them up at night because of the payment. But at the end of the day, if it's six months from now and you got this house or didn't get this house over $50 a month, or $100 a month, how are you going to feel, right? And most clients, if you put it like that, they're like, yeah, I'll stop going to Starbucks or I'll get my jeans from whatever, Levi's instead of Diesel, or I'll shop at Walmart for lingerie instead of Victoria's Secret, or they'll make whatever trade-off they have to make to carve 50 or $100 out of their budget in order to, hey, if you can offer 330 on this house instead of 310, we're going to lock it down. Now, of course, there's going to be appraisal considerations and you have to keep these other things in mind. But if we're just talking about the language of talking about the deal, talk about monthly payment, talk about expectations, talk about their budget. Don't talk about their price because like everybody can get freaked out, especially here in Los Angeles where our prices are insane. Everybody can get freaked out over paying 1.3 million versus 1.2 million. 
But when I break it down on the cost, and these are people that can afford a $1.3 million house, when I break it down on their costs, I'm like, hey, it's plus or minus 500 bucks one way or another. And again, the, the houses out here just have an extra zero on them, but it's all the same conversation. Um, because the person that can afford a $1.2, $1.3 million house, $500 a month doesn't really matter to them. But mentally, the language of like overpaying by $100,000, that's a really big deal, right? So again, expectation versus reality, the language you use matters. And then clean offers, please, for, for the love of goodness, please put together a clean offer. I cannot tell you how many realtors out here shoot their own client in the foot in their ability to get their offer accepted because the offer isn't submitted in the way the listing agent wants to. Does the listing agent want it uploaded to a portal? Do they want an email? Do they want it hand delivered? Do they want the contract and the disclosures? Do they want the contract and the disclosures and the pre-approval letter? Do they want the contract, the disclosures, the pre-approval letter and a picture of the clients and a letter from the family? You know, do whatever the listing agent and the seller wants. Submit a clean offer, fill out all the boxes, right? Write a cover letter. If they want it written to you then by email, make sure all the PDFs are labeled with what it is. It just blows my mind how many realtors kill their own deals because they don't submit a clean offer. So that that goes without saying, we could probably be, be labeled that point to death. Gretchen can probably speak more intelligently about than I can, but I cannot tell you the number of realtors that you know, just take this deal and put it in the round file, AKA the trash can, because they're like, dude, if this realtor and this client can't even put together a clean offer package, what are the chances I wanna be able to deal with them for 30 days? Um, and then last but not least, I would say, you've gotta work with a good lender. Obviously this part is really near and dear to my heart. And you got to work with a good lender for a couple of reasons. One, they've gotta be responsive in this market. You know, in Los Angeles for the last 10 years, every single offer that gets accepted, and, and I have one client that who, I think they're on their 36th offer. Every single offer that gets submitted, I either call at least an email, but usually call, text, and or send a video plus an email to the listing agent to say, hey, this is Scott Groves. This is why you're going to love working with our team. This client can definitely close in under 30 days. Here's the highlights of their package. You know, not giving away too much information because I have a fiduciary responsibility to the client, but I'm highlighting the client's strengths. Hey, they're putting 20% down. They've got extra money in the bank just in case something goes wrong with the appraisal, or they're doing a VA offer, zero money down, but they have some gift funds available from family if the appraisal was able, was to come in a bit below the uh, contract price and they're highly qualified, one pay stub, one W-2, we can definitely close in less than 30 days. That's my job as a lender, because just like you all, if I don't get deals accepted, if I don't get deals under contract, I don't get paid. I can have a pipeline of 300 pre-approved buyers if none of them are getting offers accepted and I'm not using the right language with them to make them feel comfortable paying a little bit over the list price or being in a competitive market, then I make no money. I'm just like you, I'm all commissioned. So we've got to learn to talk lenders, uh, talk on behalf of the client to the real estate agents, um, help sell that deal. And then also if something goes wrong, if they were planning to put 20% down and the contract price came in or the appraisal came in a bit lower than the contract price, you've got to be ready to jump in and restructure, right? Uh, so you got to work with a great lender. And then last but not least, last tip, I would recommend every single realtor, every single lender in the country to have this conversation with the client. And this is setting expectations to make sure that it matches reality. Every single one of us should be having this conversation. Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Client, just as an aside, I want to let you know at some point during the process, something is going to go horribly wrong. Pause for effect. Something is going to go horribly wrong. There are so many people working on the file or working on the transaction. Just like you've heard that saying, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to raise a real estate transaction. There's the buyer, the seller, the buyer's agent, the listing agent, the buyer agent, and listing agent's assistants. There's a title rep. In my state, there's an escrow officer. There's a flood insurance guy and a hazard insurance guy and a this guy and an appraiser and a this guy. And all these people have assistants. There's like 45 people working on the deal. Something is going to go horribly wrong. There's going to be a miscommunication. You're going to find out that the property is in a flood zone. We're going to find out something crazy. The appraisal is going to come in below the contract price. Some Something is going to go horribly wrong and our team is here to solve that problem. So when that happens, when you're having that moment, that meltdown, that apprehensiveness, I don't even know if that's a word. I went to public school. Sorry. Um, when you're having that moment, when you think the deal is going to all fall apart, do me a favor, just send me a text, 
We'll get all the correct adults in the room. We'll get all the right people on the phone and we'll solve the problem. But just know like something's going to go wrong. And then guess what? If it doesn't go wrong, you look like a freaking hero. And when it does go wrong, you get to say, hey, remember, I told you this is part of the deal. You know, the insurance agent was going to disappear on us or the lender was going to change companies mid transaction or the buyer's agent or the listing agent was going to go crazy or the client was going to go crazy or the seller wasn't going to find a replacement home or whatever, whatever goes wrong. You'll be like, yeah, we planned for this. We talked about something was going to go wrong here's the path to solve the problem right and you will you will bring your stress level down so much if you follow some of these tips you'll get more offers accepted and you'll just you'll be in a much better place with you and your client to create a referable experience so i think i got it done in under 20 minutes are we okay do we do we make it great oh my gosh so many like tidbits popped in i'm like making notes like crazy i love what you said about call text video and email i mean especially for clients that may not have the strongest buying power as you were talking about i mean thank you so much scott this was fantastic and i'm sure i mean we've got questions rolling in already so we'll save those for the end and uh, and we'll see you back here in just a little bit Awesome. Thank you. I'll be back in 25 minutes or so for Q&A. Yes. Thank you. Hello, Gretchen, aka Queen of New Construction. Hello. I'm so happy. Uh, thank you for being here with us today. Did you want to speak a little bit about like, you know, your background or anything specific? Sure. Well, I want to say first, Scott, that was awesome. I got so many nuggets and so many little uh, one-liners out of that. I can't wait to watch this again. And I've got a ton of notes and I'm sure all of you out there do as well. So um, my background is in new construction. I have worked with builders and developers directly for over 20 years, helping them um, build, market, find um, and bring the neighborhoods that they that they envision to life. Um, it's such a rewarding experience. I have a true passion for building everything. Building home is one of the most incredible experiences that you can have. And in this market, it's one of the most stressful experiences a buyer can have. So I'm excited to be here to share some of my tips and strategies with everybody. Well, thank you again for being here. And so we were talking about this a little bit yesterday, and I'm so excited to, to like hear your thoughts on this. What is happening in the market right now in new construction and any words of wisdom for like the agents out there? Sure. So uh, for all you agents out there, stay with me, stay grounded. It's going to be okay. We're going to get through it. Um, you know, what's happening in the market right now is it's crazy. Everything is happening. You name it. We have the perfect storm in a market and we're seeing it in new construction. We're seeing it in resale and the two are really starting to mimic each other in new construction. Specifically, we are seeing rising cost. Um, you know, it started with lumber packages. It doesn't cost more to cut a tree down, but it costs more to mill it all of a sudden. It's amazing. We're seeing um, supply chain interruptions. You can't get a dishwasher for eight weeks. What's up with that? Like I'm the dishwasher at my house right now. Um, and we are seeing municipalities having trouble with approvals, permits, um, you know, everything that you can imagine. And then we're seeing a lack of inventory in the resale market. We're seeing great interest rates and we are seeing people flocking to cities like Raleigh, which are migratory cities. Um, so we, we have the perfect storm. So what we are seeing boots on the ground in the new construction market right now is we're seeing a lot of what we're seeing in resale, multiple offers. We're seeing, um, you know, the builders cannot keep pace. It's taking a lot longer to build a home than it did you know, a year ago, we used to could build a $500,000 house in six months or so. You know, some of those are taking 10, 11 months a year to bring out of the ground. Um, so it, it's painful on all fronts. And, and I think the, the biggest advice that I would give to the agents out there is to really stay plugged in, stay patient and stay present in the transaction and you know like scott said he talked a lot about educating your clients up front um that's a big piece of it but but most importantly when it comes to new construction what i find that most agents struggle with is they don't understand it they don't feel like they know enough it's very easy to go out and show a resale home in new construction it's a little different and there are a lot more tedious questions that buyers ask that can kind of make an agent uncomfortable if they're not used to navigating that market. So I would say um, this is a time where you can learn. 
and really hone your skills and hone your knowledge in new construction. And that will help you throughout the entire transaction. That's great advice. And, and just adding to that, how can buyer agents be an asset um, with their, for their clients and, and coach them through this process? Because it is so different now. It is. And it starts with that upfront session you know, educating them that you just don't walk into most new construction neighborhoods now and buy and buy a house. It's, it's not that way. We're seeing wait list. We are seeing, um, you know, a house that'll come on the market and they're doing a highest and best in 12 hours or 48 hours. So really helping your clients understand that in your first meeting or when they start to you know, when they start to transition from re resale to new construction, making sure that they are in the know on the process. So just having those deep dive conversations as to um, what we're experiencing from a material standpoint and a cost standpoint. You know, we're seeing houses go up 20, 30, $40,000 in a matter of weeks or days. And that is not the big bad builder or the big bad developer. That is a chain reaction of events that have been going on for the last year. You know, we plants have been shut down from COVID. So just helping them understand that. Um, the other piece of that is that a lot of builders now are not doing pre-sales, especially, you know, seven, 800 and below. You're just not seeing that because it's really difficult to price those. Um, to give you an example, most um, framing packages are only guaranteed for the estimate that's given for a week. So you get an estimate for it, the framing package gets delivered uh, a week later and that's your cost. That's not the way it works in the market. We price a house before it ever comes out of, out of the ground and then the framing package comes 45, 60, 90 days later. So builders can't handle that, that, that higher than expected cost so they a lot of them have stopped doing pre-sales and we're seeing we're seeing speculative inventory coming to market but they're few and far between we're just not seeing you know 30 houses in any given neighborhood you're seeing anywhere from four five six seven and nine um the other piece of that is like i said before staying present during the entire process you know, it used to be as a buyer's agent of new construction, you kind of had it kind of easy. You drive your car, you pull up at the sales center, you bring your people out, you introduce them, and you can stand back and let the new construction agent do their job. And then you write the contract and, and you know, they go through the design process and you don't necessarily need to be involved in all of that. Now you do. You have to be with those people at every step of the way. If you truly want to guide them through the experience and have those referable experiences that Scott talked about, you've got to take them by the hand and be with them throughout it all. Um, going to those design appointments, making sure you're engaged with the on-site agent, making sure you're a part of those conversations because there are going to be a lot of landmines that come up. And you want to be the person that they come to as an advisor and a confidant. And the next thing is patience. Patience is really important because everything is taking longer than it should. You get right down to the finish line and you think you're ready to take the next step and bam, appraisal comes in below contract price. And that's a hard thing for people to, 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 to navigate. So persistence and patience, that, those are my two words of the season. Oh, that makes complete sense. And I'm so interested to hear, like, what do you tell your clients when they say, oh, I'm going to wait until the market calms down. The prices are so inflated right now. I mean, we're hearing that a lot in the market. What are your thoughts? We, on we that? are. And we are hearing that. And our team is hearing that. And, and I will tell you, that is, that's a scary thing. And, and I tell my clients that, and I tell my team, if you think that you want to buy a home, now is the time. Our market is not going down. We have way too many really good things happening that we just are not seeing lumber prices come down. We're not seeing land go down. We're not seeing people moving out of the area at high rates. Our market is going to continue to trend up for the next few years, if not longer. So I say, if you're ready to buy and you think you're on that train, we need to get you in as quickly as we possibly can, as quickly as you're ready. Because when you exit the market now and say, I'm going to sit on the sidelines and you come back to me six months from now, we're not going to be talking about the same house. 
-hmm. We're not going to be talking about the same neighborhoods. We're not going to be talking about the same areas. So if you love North Hills and you want to be in North Hills, now's the time. I completely agree with you uh, in that regard, especially with how low the interest rates are right now. I mean, that's not going to last forever, I'm sure. And no, I am completely on the same page. Um, in terms of like multiple offers with new construction, you touched on that a little bit. It's not, it hasn't been very common in the past. What, what are some of your um, thoughts on that and advice? So you're right. New construction typically does not have multiple offers and people are not accustomed to houses going above list price in new construction. I get the, the I get yelled at so much over this from other agents and, and it is a sign of where we are. So what a lot of my advice on multiple offers in new construction and really making sure that your clients are really well represented it's a lot of the same things that Scott said. You know, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. You know, you show up and you make sure that you're present. You start working with the on-site agent. Make sure you've got all of their questions answered ahead of time so that when that home does come to market or those that block of home comes to market, that your, your clients are ready to go, making sure they're pre-approved, but making sure that you're asking that agent the right questions. What do you feel like is going to happen? What are your typical deposits? But keeping in mind that just because the builder is asking for a $5,000 builder deposit doesn't mean that's what's going to get the deal. It might be $10,000 or $20,000. So making sure that you're asking those questions um, and, and what kind of activity they have. You know, don't assume that they have multiple offers on any property. Don't assume that they don't have any offers. Make sure you're finding out, you know, what kind of activity are you seeing? What can we do to win is a great question. You know, most agents will, will absolutely help you through that. They're not going to tell you specifically, but they're probably going to say, you know what, you need to come in strong. And, 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 and that would be an indicator that you really need to put pen to paper and try to come up with a great number. I think um, making sure that that your buyer's um, story has been told is a huge thing as well. You know, this is it's it's not a Broadway show or a beauty contest or anything, but you need to make sure that you're articulating who your folks are and why they want the neighborhood. And just, you know, anything that you can do to plug into that other agent, they're not the ones making the decision, but they do have influence. And so anything that you can do to, to give a memory point or build rapport with that agent to, to, to make them really take a strong look at your offer is going to be hugely important in this market. So true. And I tell my team, a text message does not cut it. You got to get on the phone, Good. build that rapport. It mm -hmm. makes all the difference, like you're saying. Yeah. And, you know, my team is like, yeah, the agent won't answer the phone. I'm like, well, drive to her. I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> Go find her. She is here somewhere. Right. I just saw her on Facebook at Cowfish. Like, you know, um, that. they will talk to you, but you have to be willing to go the extra mile right now. Because if you go the extra mile, your clients are so much more apt to win. And they are so much better to be raving fans than if you just go, well, that's, that's the way it is. I sent her a text. Right, right. Absolutely. And to all the agents out there, I mean, pick up the phone. I mean, what Gretchen said is spot on building that rapport, talking about your clients and asking that question. I love what you said. Like, what does it take to win? Those are important things because mm -hmm. you're right. The, the, um, the, the onsite agent has influence over yeah. the offer selected and the more comfortable they feel with the buyers, mm -hmm. the, the better the chances are. So thank and, you for that. Another thing I love when people tell me as a listing agent for new construction, I love an agent that comes in saying, you know what, Gretchen, I'm going to make this easy for you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be here. I'm not jumping ship. You're not going to have to run everything down. I'm going to make this easy for you. And I hate to say it, but we're all doing the same job right now. It's, mm -hmm. it's hard. It's not the easiest market that we've ever been in, not for the listing agents and not for the buyer agents. So anything that we can do to support each other and make sure that they understand that this is going to close is a benefit. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And making that known that this will be an easy process. You're spot on with that. It makes all the difference. It really does. Um, what do you feel like is going to happen down the line? You know, we keep seeing the lumber prices increasing and, you know, the lack of like pre-sales and uh, because just of cost, what do you see happening with new construction as the months progress? 
I see that continuing. I don't see lumber going down. We're not seeing land pricing going down and we're not seeing municip municipalities being any friendlier at this point in time. That, that piece may change because they all know that we need inventory. Um, we see people moving further out. Um, we're seeing the exburbs, which is my new favorite term. It used to be the suburbs, right? But the exburbs are the cities beyond the city that is a suburb. So we're seeing a lot of that. You know, Franklin County, Johnston County, Harnett County are really becoming places where people can go and live an incredible lifestyle, get a home they can afford, um, and and really enjoy being in it, being in a great um, exurb of Raleigh. So I think that that we're not going to see any of that change. And I think with Apple coming, with Amazon coming with uh, Fuji Films and all of the other tech industries that have announced. I just, I don't see this changing. I see builders continuing to build speculative inventory, houses that already have colors selected. So making sure that your clients know that, you know, when you come to pick a house at Frame, and you're probably not gonna be able to change anything, and, but it's gonna be beautiful, it's gonna be modern. Um, so I just, I don't, I don't see builders being able to keep up. I mean, we are in this position right now because we haven't built enough houses in this market mm -hmm. uh, over the last five years. This is not a COVID thing. The lumber maybe is a COVID thing, but we just haven't kept up with demand. These builders are still reeling from 2008, 9, and 10. They took a butt whipping and they've never added on what they needed to add on uh, to, to really build enough homes in this market. So I don't see it ending. Yeah, I, I completely agree. That makes total sense. And, you know, you mentioned a couple experts. I love that term. I'm going to steal that. Uh, I stole it from the business journal. I didn't create that. <laughs> okay. I'm like, I'm stealing it. Um, where do you see, like, if you had to choose, like, one or two, you know, cities beyond where we are, where do you see the next, like, hot spots that may not be on everybody's radar? I love Johnston County. I love Nightdale in Wake County. Wendell is the cutest little town. Zebulon, yeah. Middlesex, Youngsville is so up and coming. Their downtown, if you haven't been to Youngsville lately, is off the charts amazing. They have got some of the cutest little stores. Harnett County down below Fuquay and Holly Springs, they are building, they have got tons of neighborhoods and approvals. I don't know what the number is, but I want to say last I heard it was in the thousands, which is crazy to me. Wow. Of houses of lots that have been approved and are it under construction. So I think those are all great assets. You know, going down that 64, 260, 64 quarter or 264, it's an easy entrance into Raleigh. You know, yeah. it's it's already four lanes and you can get from Zebulon to Raleigh in 18 minutes. So I think we're seeing it there. And then of course Chatham County. Right. I mean, you can't you can't not count Chatham County and Pittsburgh. And these are wonderful little towns that are still super convenient because let's face it, not everybody needs to drive to downtown Raleigh. Right. You, know, you can get from Chatham County to RTP in 30 minutes, which is great. Right. Oh, that's great. I jotted all those down. So thank you for that. Great investment opportunities if you can get in soon enough. So uh, thank you so much. Is there anything else that before we bring Scott back and go through, we've got several questions here. Anything else that that we may have missed that you wanted to add or? I, I don't need to add a thing. I'm happy to answer any questions and you guys all can feel free to just reach out to me directly too. Well, thank you. You have been a wealth of knowledge and answered so many questions that I had actually even before uh, starting this. So uh, Scott, if you want to turn your camera back on. I'm here. Welcome back. Um, and by the way, Gretchen, thank you for the knowledge. I had no idea that builders could only lock in some of their costs for yeah. seven days. I just assumed, you know, kind of like you buy futures, pork bellies or whatever. I was like, oh, I just assumed they could they could dial in the cost for six months out or something. So that makes tons of sense why they can't do pre-sales. Yeah. Some of the build, bigger builders can. The nationals can do that, right? But the smaller builders, which is what the bread and butter of our market is and probably yours too, they can't do that. So I'm excited to be on screen with you. Like, how cool is this? Good peoples. Um, yeah. How, how else can we help, Tiffany? What? Uh, yeah. What so we'll start what with the hearing? first question. Uh, first question is, what is the most interesting trend, good or bad, you've seen so far in 2021? Ooh, can I take one? Can I take this one first? Go for it. Um, my favorite trend of 2021 is the pocket office. 
It is so underrated, but nobody wants an entire 400 square foot room of their house to be an office. So these little nooks and crannies in the pocket offices that we're seeing that are coming out of COVID, I'm loving. Um, you know, my favorite trend, and we talked about this a little bit before we got started, is that this forced, you know, the silver lining of COVID, it forced everybody into the 21st century. Yeah. Like, you know, I love seeing people, I'm a people person, but no offense, I, I don't want to spend every night of my life at a mixer or a cocktail party or, a, you know, even a YPN event, as great as they are. You know, I don't want to have to have an event every single night. Like, I actually really like my wife and my family, and I like doing jujitsu. So the fact that we can knock out high quality content like this in an hour on Zoom and everybody's used to it, that's my favorite trend of this year. It's like, you know, two years ago, I told somebody to jump on Zoom and they were like, what's that? Now my, now my mom uses Zoom and my mom, it took her 20 years to buy a cell phone. So uh, to me, that's my favorite trend is we can be so much more efficient and get stuff done digitally that just wasn't a reality two years ago. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And um, what has helped you get to where you are and what advice do you have for others who want to set off in that same direction? Scott, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. I will say my life changed two times in business. Uh, one was when I started taking database management seriously. So everybody that comes into my ecosystem now, they either go into a database of potential clients or potential referral sources. You know, Tiffany and Gretchen, I'm not licensed in your state. You probably don't have a whole lot of buyers in Los Angeles, but you will be on my list because at some point we're, there's gonna be some synergy and we're gonna do business together. So number one is database. And then number two is calendar. Um, a lot of people think that I either don't sleep or I do illicit drugs or something like that. I don't do any of that stuff. I get a good night's sleep. I don't do any drugs, um, but I just manage my calendar in a way where it's like, Workout is at 6 a.m., lead generation calls at 8.30, prospecting from 10 to 11. Everything is color-coded. And, and people look at my calendar and they laugh at me and they're like, you have date night on your calendar? You have, you know, workout time with your kids on your calendar? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Because if that doesn't go on my calendar, I don't do it. And then I feel like a horrible husband and a horrible father. And so database management, taking that super seriously and calendar management, running your business like a business that's the, those were like the two biggest step ups in my career. I would totally agree with that. I think those are great things. And so I'm not going to repeat those, but I also think, um, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years and there is no substitute for sheer will and persistence. Right. And I have failed so many more times than I have succeeded. So I would say that you've got to just know that it doesn't matter what anybody says, whether they say that you can do it or you can't do it. And if they call you crazy, that's even more reason you should do it. So just continuing to remind yourself that failing is not failure. It's education and being persistent and getting back up and continuing to try because you know, in growing a team and working with a lot of young professionals out there, I see people who quit just right before they break through, right? They just quit a little bit too early. And, it, and, 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 and I know what's on the other side of that breakthrough. And it's everything that they ever wanted. It's freedom. It's um, the lifestyle. It is being able to, you know, work with people you want to work with, not the jerks out there, right? So stay in it long enough to win and you got to celebrate the wins along the way. Even if it's just getting up and making your couple hours of prospecting calls, pat yourself on the back, whether you get an appointment or not, you did it, you showed up. The other thing is coaching. I am a firm believer, as I know that Scott is because he is a coach, in coaching. The times in my life that I have leveled up substantially and taken those quantum leaps where everybody looks around and goes, where did she come from? She's an overnight success. Not right. Um, I have worked my butt off for this, but that coaching and being able to plug into someone who was where I wanted to be has been a game changer for me. And it's an investment, but you are worth the investment. If you're not going to bet on yourself, your clients aren't going to bet on you either. And neither are the people in your brokerage. So I feel like we're in an industry and mortgage is probably the same way. I don't know, but um, we're in an industry where we don't get a lot of support. 
We don't get a lot of training. We don't have people mentor us. Like you don't get to come on the job and work with somebody for two weeks. That's crazy. So you got to figure that out and you got to figure it out earlier than later. And when you think you can't afford it, that's when you need to do it because putting that, that money on the line every month to be able to talk to somebody and run through your day and figure out how to structure your business is going to pay for itself a hundred times over. And I'm sure you agree with that, Scott. A hundred percent. I have three coaches. I got a jujitsu coach. I got, a, <laughs> I got, a, I got a life coach and I got a business coach. So, yeah. Um, yeah I, I pay more for coaching in a year than I made in 2009. Mm -hmm. um, but it's yep. because, you know, you make that investment in yourself and stuff takes care of itself. It does. It's like putting it out in the universe and you're working on it. You're focusing on it. And it, that's important. It, it's important, especially when you're brand new in the business. Totally. The question for you guys, and I completely agree with this. I have had a coach since the early, early days and it has made such a big difference. And I think I went without for six months and I saw a huge impact because that accountability is key. So for agents who are like, oh my gosh, then I want to get a coach right now, you know, and take Gretchen and Scott's advice. Where do they start? How do they look for a coach? Um, you know, I've never had that question before, but I would say, um, just going on to social media profiles and finding people who resonate with you, you know, they got to be reputable, but they also have to be where you want to be. So I've coached with male coaches before, and that's great, but male coaches have never balanced motherhood, right? So I wanted someone who was running a real estate business, who, who, who was still actively running it and who had children. So I poked around online. I asked people, ask your referral network, ask, ask people in your brokerages and follow those people, sign up for their free stuff, get on their email list, make sure they resonate with you. Don't just do it after a week of like going on Instagram and finding somebody going, oh, hey, here's a real estate coach. I like them. Um, you really need to make sure that it's a fit for you because um, having a bad coach is way worse than no coach. Great advice. Yeah, and I would say just like anywhere else, success leaves clues, right? Mm -hmm. So I've seen a lot of people sign up with coaches because they're $99 a month on Instagram and they've got yeah. the new flashy, you know, widget or whatever. Find out who's successful in your market and find out who they coach with. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, what's beautiful is like, you can get 60, 70, 80% of a coach's content for free on YouTube, on their website, whatever, you can really see if somebody's your cup of tea. Like I always tell people when they sign up with me, I'm ex-military, I cuss a lot. I will never cuss <laughs> at you, but I cuss a lot. So if that's gonna be a turnoff, don't sign up. Like I'm not your cup of tea. Go coach with my buddy Kai, cause he's a little bit more mild mannered than I am. Um, but you, you can get so much information for free online and then pick somebody, invest in them, invest in yourself. Yeah. Great advice. Um, next question. What are the most common misconceptions people have about multiple offers and how we can combat and communicate that more effectively? Um, I think that the most common myth or uh, misconception that I see is that there's no way to win and that you're going to pay way more than the house is worth and that you're going to be taken advantage of. And that comes from fear. Most of us intrinsically run from, from things that would seem dangerous. So those kinds of thoughts really make it seem like it's it maybe not worth entering the market or you're not going to be able to be successful. So why even start? So I would just call that out. Like we have a, um, we have a document that we give out to all of our buyers called uh, Crafting Winning Offer. And we start talking about 12 different things that they need to consider before we ever put them in the car, before we ever get to contract, um, when it comes to crafting a winning offer. And I find that that addressing those things up front and saying, listen, this is, this is not for the faint of heart right now, but we are going to find you a house. We're going to stick together. We're going to figure out exactly what your needs are, and we are going to win. Um, and, and then coaching them through those decisions that have to be made, like your due diligence money, your earnest money, the terms, move in, rent back price, all of those things, and really starting to craft that strategy up front helps to put that fear aside. They're still going to have some of it, but they're not going to feel like they're equipped to fail right from the beginning. Very good. Yeah. And I would say for the agents or the lenders who are calling the listing agent, you know, this is again, kind of just back to sales 101, spend some time being interested instead of interesting, right? 
And I would say that a lot of buyer's agents call the listing agent and they say, here's my client and they're really great and they can do this and they can do that without ever asking the client or the listing agent, like, hey, what's important to your seller? Mm -hmm. Are they just a mercenary and all they want is the highest price? Mm -hmm. Or do they need a lease back? Do they need this? You know, do they care about the fact that they're gonna sell to another family so that their kids can enjoy the same backyard, right? There's so many things that go into a deal other than just the price. And I've had a lot of clients in this crazy market in LA win deals by not being the highest offer, but saying, yeah. hey, we'll let you lease back the house for 15 days for a dollar so that it's a legal contract. But like, take your time getting out of the house. We know you've been there 20 years. It's going to be an emotional detachment from this place you've resided in. And boom, you know, they save $10,000, $20,000 off the price because they give good terms. So, you know, be interested in what's going on with the listing agent and the seller versus just vomiting information on how great your buyer is. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, and, want, to, and I want to put one more thing in there because Scott um, hit that nail on the head earlier when he said, make it easy on the listing agent. Mm -hmm. Make sure your paperwork's in line. Write your email with all the bullet points of the terms. Make sure they're labeled properly. Make sure you have everything. Those little things go a long way. Yep. Just assume they are, they're sending it over to the sellers. You're exactly right. That is so true. And I, it's amazing. Just even as a listing agent, you know, with listings coming in, how many people just send a dot loop and you don't even know, like, it's like just an email, you know, you're like, yeah. is this, what is this? So no, a hundred percent. I am interested too. This isn't one of the questions. We've got one more left, but I'm really interested to dig into uh, marketing. Tell us about your marketing plan. Like how did you get started Gretchen? And then Scott also, I know you've got a, you've got a lot of marketing out there also that that you do um how do you how do you structure a marketing plan like what tell us a little bit about like instagram facebook what works any tips will be great video sure. any so i um i took a break in between new construction and general brokerage for about four years so when i came back into general brokerage i felt like i was starting over and i'm just going to tell you i didn't want to make phone calls like so necess uh, innovation is born out of necessity right I didn't want to call anybody. I was like, I had all this fear. I just didn't want to talk to anybody. So I started doing video. And that's really how my entire marketing plan started. And it still is today. It is video dominant. Video is the medium. It has been the medium for 10 years for communication. So um, if you are not doing video yet, you should make video a piece of your marketing plan. It's so important and it will, it, it will bring people to you that are warm and ready because they've seen you, they've looked in your eyes, they've connected with you and they feel like they already have a relationship with you, but not just doing real estate video. You need to do video about your life, who you are, places in your city. Like you need to be an advocate of your city, right? You need to be an advocate of your community or your neighborhood. And the other thing that was a part of my marketing plan was doing the things that I really liked to do. I love doing video and I loved Instagram. So that's kind of the two places that I play. Uh, you can always get me on Instagram at Gretchen Colby Group. I'm in the DMs all the time. Um, and so I just started growing there. And it's amazing the reach that those, um, that those platforms have. So when it comes to marketing, I say start with what you love and build on that because that's where you're going to be the most authentic and i'm sure scott can, can speak to that if you are not authentic in today's market who you are where you are at this moment in time when people see you in person the trust is broken and you will never get it back so you can't use old photos you you, you got to be using the mediums that work now so really figuring out what your budget is and how to leverage the free things that you can do is the next piece of that. You have to have a marketing budget. If it's $25 a week, that's what it is. If it's $1,000 a month, that's what it is. So how can you take those dollars and allocate them the most? You know, digital advertising is really cheap and easy. Uh, social media, you can still get a great reach. TikTok is a place that I want to infiltrate. And I'm sure a lot of you out there who are so young are ready to go on TikTok. That is a place where you can go get 40,000 followers if you're producing the right content. You can have them in the next six months. So um, I would say really leveraging things that you like and getting your budget in line. I love that so much. I wish I looked like Gretchen. I would go on TikTok or video. Or <laughs> Um, I know, right? I mean, it's the a, hair's it's all perfect. perfect. And yeah. you know how many balls? Oh um, 
You, you know, one of the things I wrote about in my book is you have to understand what your marketing style is. And I either say like, you're a sniper rifle or you're a shotgun. Like either you're really good at building those one relationships at a time, you know, what a lot of people would call their sphere of influence. And if that's your shtick, like if you're really good at going deep with people, then maybe you only need like five or eight key referral sources. You know, you need a divorce attorney and a financial planner and a couple matriarchs in the community that know everybody and are well connected. So if that's you, be you and go super deep with those people. If you're more like me and you're kind of more the shotgun approach, well, then I've got to do, you know, weekly email blasts, a lot of Facebook lives, a lot of videos. Like I kind of just put myself out there to all the people. And I'll be honest, because I don't go super deep with my referral sources, I've had a few referral sources over the last 20 years disappear, fall back in love with me, disappear, fall back in love with me. But it's okay because there's plenty of business in the market. I just keep shotgunning more out there. So I think, you know, before you start investing in a platform or digital marketing, just get real authentic with yourself of like, Hey, do I go really deep with people? And I need to have these like 10 core referral sources, or am I just kind of like put myself out there and see where the chips fall? Cause they are slightly different marketing strategies and you can find everything about YouTube on YouTube about which to do in those two verticals. But that's what I would say. Get authentic with yourself about what kind of person are you before you go out and just start putting out a bunch of content. I love that. That is great advice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, and I, for the people who are afraid to get on camera, any advice before we move on to the last camera? I hear that a lot. Oh, I don't want to get on camera. You know, I any hear it all the time. And in fact, I'm teaching a class at uh, the Top Producers Council in June for those of you who are part of Top Producers. If you're not, you should come check it out um, on video because most of the time, the biggest fear is what if I say something stupid? Or what if I embarrass myself or I don't like the way I look or I don't like the way I sound? Well, my advice is to say your friends and your family already know what you look like, what you sound like, and they know the little nuances that you do, the little quirks that you have. That's you. That is authentic. So just go on and talk about something that you know a lot about. That'll take the whole edge off of it. And you got you and, and and just put the camera up and practice. Like this phone is magic. It can do anything. So put it up on your on your desk in front of a window is really all you need. You'll get great light. You won't see any wrinkles and you'll look beautiful and fresh and glowing. And um and start talking and talk like you're talking to Tiffany, like you're talking to somebody who's sitting across the table from you. Because what I know about being a realtor is you answer the same questions over and over and over again, right? So write down the top three questions that you were asked today. Write down the last question you were asked. Put the phone up in front of a window and share your answer. It's that easy. And, you know, don't worry about the rest of it because you're going to attract the people who are attracted to you. And that's what you want. That makes your business easy and smooth. There's not a lot of resistance when you're working with people who like, know, and trust you. Dude, Gre Gretchen hit the number one tip and I, I just want to emphasize it. Talk to one person. So when I go Facebook live, you know, I'll have a couple hundred realtors watch or comment on the video. I'm always talking to Kenya Reeves Costa. She's one of my favorite realtors. We have great conversations. So when I'm doing something informative in my mind, I'm talking to Kenya. I just happen to be recording it and broadcasting it out to everybody else. Mm -hmm. When I'm talking to a coaching client, I'm talking to my friend, Cole Strange, who's an awesome loan officer up and coming, been doing about five years. When I'm giving tips for loan officers, I'm talking directly to Cole Strange. It just happens to be going to a thousand loan officers. So think of it that way. And it takes all the stress off because you're like, oh yeah, of course I can talk to Susie. I've yeah. talked to Susie a million times. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing too, cause Scott, cause I think that is so important. Like when you're talking to one person, you're really dialed in in your focus. So um, picking, picking out one piece of information that you want to give to that person and delivering it. You can even start with just doing video text messages, right? So if you want to video to your client, you want to really practice, just pick up the tech, the phone and talk to it and, and answer the question that your client just sent you in a text and send it to them. Don't pause. Don't, don't, don't stop. Don't watch it. Just send it. And that's kind of how you can practice if you don't want your video to live on mainstream media, which if you're gonna, it's going to go way further if you put it out there rather than going one-to-one. -one. Totally agree. 
hundred percent. Yes. And last question that we have, um, what are some examples of pain points for new construction buyers other than current rising costs? Um, this agent is currently under contract with a client whose home is supposed to be finished in August, September, and they're struggling to find reasons to reach out uh, to the client to touch base and stay connected. So that's a great question because the new construction process is really long. So I would say, um, you know, when people are building a home, they're excited. And whether you think that or not, they're, they're really, it's an anticipatory time. They're probably driving by the house. So reaching out and just, and just saying, hey, I'm just checking in. You know, have you been by the house lately? Just talk to them about what's going on in their life, what's going on with their job, what's going on. You know, you can talk to them about anything. Some of the pain points that they have are, stressing about when is the house going to be ready um, or that they've dr driven out there a couple weeks in a row and they don't feel like anything has been done. That is typically because they're waiting on supplies or they're waiting on inspections, things like that. So um, I would say those two are the biggest when you're waiting. And when you start to get to the end, then they're starting, you sh really should be talking to them every week because you need to be making sure the loan stop is is happening. You need to be making sure there's no hiccups there. Attorneys are scheduled. You don't want to depend on the on-site agent only to handle that for you. But maybe you just do a, you know, put it on your calendar to call the buyer once a week. You call the, the agent, find out what's going on in the neighborhood, find out how many houses they've sold. And so you've got some information to communicate. You're, you don't feel like you're just picking up the phone going, hey, it's me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the only other thing I would add from the lender's perspective is loop in the loan officer frequently to get an update. Because I know uh, my wife, for example, put something under contract in November, certificate of occupancy is not ready yet, and rates have changed dramatically since November. So again, getting back to the first thing I talked about, expectations versus reality, looping in the lender once in a while to get an update on rates, payments, terms, mortgage insurance costs, things of that nature, just really helpful so your client doesn't get to the closing table and be like, oh my goodness, the payment's $100 lower, $100 higher. Like this is not what I expected. So um, obviously they're more frustrated when it gets higher versus lower, but you get my point. <laughs> There's always something to talk about. Absolutely. And, and thank you guys so much. We're right at time. Um, Again, I cannot thank you both enough for, for being a part of YPN today and talking with everyone. The feedback is just coming in like crazy. Everybody like hand claps and hearts. And uh, we are just so appreciative of your time because we know you guys are super busy and grateful that you all took this morning to be with us. And I got I have a page of notes. So thank you both so much. Um, really and truly such great information. And uh, is there anything else that you wanted to share before we we log off. Scott, we I need to know how to, to say, find you. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Go ahead. No, we need to know how to find you, Scott. Yeah, and, and I'm on social media. Everybody can find me on Facebook. I just, say, I just want to say thank you so much. I feel like I made a new friend in Tiffany and Gretchen. And the last thought I'll leave everybody with is like, embrace the challenges, embrace the suck, like make it harder, right? If, if everybody can make 100 or 200 or $500,000 in this industry, in this business, um, then everybody would do it. Like we want it to get harder so that those of us that survive just pick up more market share. So just embrace the challenges, embrace the tough market, embrace the suck, because when you come out the other side, you're gonna have more business than you know what to do with. And I think so many people need to hear that right now, Scott. Thank you so much. And that's a good way to conclude. Again, guys, you were total rock stars, and we so appreciate you and look forward to future events. Great to see you, Tiffany. Scott, you're amazing. Thank you so much. Talk soon. Bye, guys. See ya.